Good evening and welcome. Tonight we're going to begin reading through this book, Man-Made Wonders of the World. This book was donated to my channel by Sabrina. Thank you so much, Sabrina. I was so excited to receive this one. And you can donate a book to my channel down in the description. My Amazon wish list is down there. I was really excited because I have the other half of this series, The Natural Wonders of the World, which I've already read the North America chapter out of that. So we're going to start the North America chapter out of Man-Made Wonders, and then we'll take turns going back and forth between natural and man-made in each of the areas of the world. So, let's just dive right in. I should note that North America in this case just means like Canada and the United States. So, Central America is lumped in with South America, which I suppose is a good idea since, you know, there's so many different interesting buildings throughout the United States and Canada and putting some extra with South America. Not that there's not as many in South America, but there's less countries in South America, you know. Well, I guess too. Never mind. I'm digging myself into a hole here. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> anyway, we're going to start off. I think these are grouped by, like, time. So we are starting off with Chaco Canyon. Also, sorry if there's a little wobble on this arm. I got my extra long arm out to film this big old book. And it's a little wobbly, I don't know why. So, I'm sorry if that bothers you. But anyway, back to Chaco Canyon. The ancestral Puebloans are a Native American people who thrived in the southwestern U.S. from around 750 to 1350 CE. They were great builders, constructing around 125 towns connected by an impressive system of roads. The finest of these towns lie in the Chaco Canyon, in a remote area of northwest New Mexico. Most notable are the 15 large D-shaped complexes, the largest buildings in North America until the late 1800s. These apartment-style structures were made from stone, adobe mud, and other materials, with timber often hauled to the site from up to 70 miles away. Pueblo Bonito. The most famous ancestral Puebloan town, Pueblo Bonito, built around 1050 CE, spreads over more than 110,000 square feet and contains at least 650 rooms. It supported a population of more than 1,200 people. Pueblo Bonito and the other towns acted both as ceremonial centers and many of their buildings align with key stages of the solar and lunar cycles, and trading centers for food and luxury goods such as turquoise. We're going to read all the little boxes in another series. We're going to read through all the, the basic info and then come back, so don't worry about that. Next is Cliff Palace. You can see right there. <laughs> While some Puebloan towns lay on open ground, many more were built into the sides of steep cliffs. Such protected locations are easily defensible, suggesting that they were built at times of increasing competition among local tribes for scarce resources. Primeval Palace The most impressive of these dwellings is Cliff Palace, found in a canyon in the Mesa Verde Plateau of southwest Colorado. Built between 1190 and 1260, it was mainly constructed of sandstone blocks and wooden beams held together with a mortar of soil, ash, and water. The palace contains around 150 rooms and 23 sunken kivas. The high number of kivas suggests that Cliff Palace was the center of a widespread local community. However, the site was abandoned by 1300, probably in response to extreme drought. Next is Serpent Mound. Can you see it there? That's a neat mound shape. The Serpent Mound winds for 1,348 feet along a plateau beside the Ohio Brush Creek in southern Ohio. 
It curves comfortably around the land. Its head is close to a cliff above the creek and its seven coiled body ending in a triple coiled tail. It lies on the now concealed site of an ancient crater formed by the impact of a meteorite millions of years ago. It is not known if this event affected its placement or design. The earthwork was one of numerous mounds created by the Native American cultures that cultivated the fertile river valleys in Ohio. Most have been destroyed by modern agricultural practices. The Mouth of the Snake The snake is made of a layer of yellowish clay and ash, reinforced with a layer of rocks and covered with soil. Its open mouth extends around the end of a 120-foot long oval hollow that might represent the snake eating an egg, although the oval could also symbolize the sun or frog or merely be a remnant of a platform. Dating Difficulties Originally thought to be the work of the Adena people, who lived between 1000 BCE and 200 BCE, the serpent was later attributed to the Fort Ancient Culture from around 1070 CE on the basis of carbon dating undertaken in 1996. However, more recent dating carried out in 2014 reallocates it to around 320 BCE, apparently reaffirming its Adena origins. The purpose of the mound remains obscure. Its head does align with the summer solstice sunset, indicating some calendrical or ceremonial function, but it is more likely that the mound had a place in funerary rites, perhaps directing spirits of the dead from the nearby burial mound. Next we have, let me slide this over so you can see, it's Monticello. In 1768, aged just 26, the lawyer and politician Thomas Jefferson inherited eight square miles of land just outside Charlottesville, Virginia, from his father. He farmed the land using slave labor, and indulging his interest in architecture, drew the blueprints for a plantation house. He based his design on the principles of the Italian Renaissance architect Andrea Palladio. Little Mount Jefferson lived in the house named Monticello, from the Italian for Little Mount, from 1770. Following the death of his wife Martha, he traveled to France in 1784, and in 1785 took the post of minister to France. Inspired by the architecture he saw in Paris, he returned to the U.S. with new plans for Monticello, which he remodeled and enlarged, adding a central octagonal dome and transforming the eight-room villa into a 21-room house in the neoclassical style. He lived in the house until his death in 1826, moving to Washington during his presidency. And speaking of which, the White House, where he would have moved to. The neoclassical building at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. is perhaps the most famous structure in the world. Debatable. Every president since John Adams in 1800 has lived in the White House, and it is popularly known. The President's Residence The residence was designed by James Hoban, who modeled it on Leinster House, Dublin. It was built between 1792 and 1800. The West Wing was added in 1901, and the famous Oval Office was created in 1909. A myth has arisen that during the rebuilding of the mansion after the British sacked and burned Washington in 1814, white paint was used to mask the damage, hence its modern name, but the exterior has been coated with a lime-based whitewash to protect it from moisture and frost from as early as 1798. And next is the U.S. Capitol, which is a cool picture of the dome up there. Let's read about it. When the U.S. became an independent nation in 1783, it had neither a capital city nor a congress hall. In 1790, the Residence Act settled on a site on the Potomac River in Maryland to be the nation's new capital. It was named Washington in honor of the first president, George Washington. Pierre-Charles L'Enfant, a French-American military engineer, drew up a basic plan for the city, placing the legislative building on what is now Pennsylvania Avenue, linking it to the President's House. He named the new building the Congress House, 
but Thomas Jefferson insisted it be named the Capitol, a Latin word associated with the Capitoline Hill, one of the seven hills of ancient Rome, creating the Capitol. In 1792, Jefferson proposed a design competition for the new building. Amateur architect William Thornton submitted a design inspired by the east front of the Louvre Palace in Paris in January 1793. The cornerstone was laid by Washington on September 18, 1793, and the building was completed by 1811. Next is, as you can see here, the Brooklyn Bridge. Here we go. Brooklyn Bridge is by no means the longest or the tallest bridge in the U.S., although it was the longest and first steel wire suspension bridge in the world when it was built nor is it the most advanced. It is not even the only bridge that crosses New York's East River, but it can claim to be one of the most famous bridges in the world, as much an icon of its home city as the Statue of Liberty or the Empire State Building. The 5,989-foot-long bridge links Manhattan with its neighboring borough of Brooklyn, spanning the river. The idea of a bridge across the East River was conceived in 1852 by John Augustus Roebling, a German immigrant. Work began in 1869 under his son, Washington. While the finished bridge was technically a suspension bridge, one in which the deck is hung below suspension cables on vertical suspenders, it employed a hybrid cable stayed design in which a fan-like pattern of cables also ran directly down from the two towers to support the main deck. On May 24, 1883, the bridge was officially opened by President Chester A. Arthur, who crossed it together with New York's Mayor Franklin Edison. The bridge was initially designed to carry horse-drawn and rail traffic, with a separate elevated walkway in the center for pedestrians and cyclists. The last trains ran in 1944, and in 1950 the streetcars that shared the roadway also stopped. The bridge was then reconfigured to carry six lanes of cars. Height and weight restrictions keep commercial vehicles and buses off the bridge. Let's see what's next. It is a page we'll read on another day. We're going to get to this one. Next is the Washington Monument. Look at this cool photo of it from almost above it. Sorry for the shadow, but really interesting photos of some of these places from really interesting angles. Let's read about this obelisk. Given its importance as a national landmark, the Washington Monument in the U.S. Capitol had a perilous gestation. Built to honor George Washington, the first president of the U.S., the monument was started in 1848, but construction work was halted from 1854 to 1876 due to lack of funds and the intervention of the Civil War. It was eventually completed in 1884. The original design for the monument by Robert Mills imagined a 600-foot high obelisk surrounded by 30 pillars that were 100 feet high, but the plans were scaled down when building resumed in 1876. The monument is a hollow obelisk made of marble, granite, and bluestone gneiss that stands 555 feet high, capped by a 55-foot high pyramidion. I always said nice. I, I never know if that's actually how you say it, but that's what I've always said. I'm not a rock expert. Next, we have this fantastic picture here of the flat iron building. There's a picture here of it being built, so you can kind of get a better idea of its shape like an iron. <laughs> Hence the name. This dramatic Manhattan skyscraper owes its aggressive wedge shape to a desire to make best use of expensive New York real estate. The site itself was known in the 1850s as Eno's Flatiron, after the owner Amos Eno and its close iron-like shape. The land was sold in 1901 to an investment partnership created by Harry S. Black of the George A. Fuller Company. Their new building was to be named the Fuller Building, but locals persisted in calling it the Flatiron. Construction started in June 1901 and proceeded at a fast pace as the steel used for the building's skeleton was pre-cut, enabling the skyscraper to rise by a story a week. The 22-story building was finished in June 1902. 
The design by Daniel Burnham takes the form of a vertical Renaissance palazzo with bow art styling. The overall form of the flat iron is based on a classical Greek column with a limestone base and a glazed terracotta shaft and capital on top. Next we have, heading up to Canada, Chateau Fontenay. As the railway network expanded across Canada, the rail companies developed a series of grand hotels to serve their passengers in style. Almost all of them were chateau-like in design, with towers, turrets, and other Scottish, baronial, and French chateau elements. Of these grand hotels, the most famous is Chateau Frontenac in Quebec City, built by the Canadian Pacific Railway. This imposing building stands at the eastern edge of Old Quebec's upper town, high on a hill above the St. Lawrence River. A French Gothic extravaganza. Chateau Frontenac was designed by Bruce Price, one of the main architects employed by the Canadian Pacific Railway to design their hotels. Built in 1892 to 1893, the hotel is modeled on the chateau found in the Loire Valley in France, but with additional Gothic and high Victorian elements. Presenting an asymmetrical profile to the city beneath, its most commanding features are its steeply pitched roofs, massive towers and turrets, and tall chimneys. The hotel stands on a grey stone ashlar base and is faced with Glenboig fire clay bricks made in Lanarkshire, Scotland. Lanarkshire? I'm not sure. Its interior is a wealth of marble staircases, mahogany panels, wrought iron, and carved stone. The hotel has 611 guest rooms and numerous reception rooms, bars, and other facilities. On its roof are four beehives. There are 70,000 bees producing around 650 pounds of honey a year. Among the hotel's executive suites are the Trudeau Trudeau Suite, named after the father and son Canadian Prime Ministers. And next we have a little photo of it down here, sorry. It's Biltmore House. The Gilded Age was a period of rapid economic growth and conspicuous wealth in the U.S. None came wealthier than George Washington Vanderbilt II whose childhood visits to Asheville, North Carolina, inspired him to build his own summer estate there. Designed by New York architect Richard Morris Hunt, Biltmore is modeled on the French Chateau of the Loire Valley, popular style to copy, <laughs> as well as the Rothschild-owned Waddesdon Manor in England. With 179,000 square feet of floor space, the 250-room, four-story house has steeply pitched roofs, turrets and towers, and sculptural ornamentation. Construction began in 1889 and continued into 1896. No expense was spared, as Biltmore was designed for an opulent Gilded Age. Next we have the Statue of Liberty. Again, look at this amazing photograph. An angle you just never even think about. Very, very cool. Let's read about her, not it. Standing tall on Liberty Island in New York Harbor, the Statue of Liberty has welcomed immigrants and visitors to the U.S. ever since it was dedicated on October 28, 1886. The 151-foot tall copper statue is a figure of Libertas, the Roman goddess of liberty. Holding a torch in her right hand to enlighten the world, and a tablet in her left hand inscribed with the Roman numerals for the date of the U.S. Declaration of Independence from Great Britain, July 4, 1776, the statue stands proudly free, the broken chains of bondage at her feet. French Origins, American Finance The idea of a statue arose in France when law professor and politician Edouard René de la Boulaye remarked to the sculptor Frederica d'Auguste Bartholdi that any monument raised to commemorate American independence should be a joint project between the American and French people, given their revolutionary ties. Bartholdi completed the head and the torch-bearing arm before he had designed the rest of the statue. He exhibited the arm at the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia in 1876 and later in New York. Fundraising proved a problem until Joseph Pulitzer, 
publisher of the New York World, appealed for funds, which then poured in from more than 120,000 contributors. The statue itself was built in France by Gustave Eiffel, later famous for his eponymous tower in Paris, and shipped to the U.S. Its completion was marked by, a new, by New York's first ticker tape parade, its dedication presided over by President Grover Cleveland. Next we have, down here, let me get to this place, the Washington National Cathedral. Let me get a drink real quick. Tonight's beverage, I usually have tea or water or flavored water. Tonight it's Red Bull. Listen, it's been so hot lately. Tonight's actually cool. I'm taking advantage of it. I'm going to film like a chunk of video this cool night so I need energy let's talk about <clears throat> excuse me the Washington National Cathedral the US does not have an official or state religion but the nearest it has to a spiritual home is the Washington National Cathedral technically called the Cathedral Church of st. Peter and st. Paul in the city and diocese of Washington this cathedral of the Episcopal Church has, from its earliest days, been a national shrine, a house of prayer for all people, and a place where several, goodness, a place where major state events and funerals could take place. Several years in the making. The building itself is in a neo-Gothic style, closely modeled on the English Gothic style of the late 14th century. Construction began in 1907, when President Theodore Roosevelt laid the foundation stone, and continued until 1990, when the final finial was placed in the presence of President George H. W. Bush, although decorative works continue to this day. And now we have one of the most famous transport stations in the world. Definitely like top five, right? Grand Central Terminal. <clears throat> Let me get one more drink. I've got a, a frog in my throat. There we go. <clears throat> Here we go. Commuters and travelers from upstate New York and Connecticut flood into New York City via Grand Central Terminal, the largest working train station in the U.S. and the third busiest in North America. Its 44 platforms are all underground, serving 56 different passenger tracks on two different levels with an additional 11 sidings. Two even deeper levels are currently under construction. Hmm. The terminal is among the world's top 10 most visited tourist destinations, with numbers easily exceeding 22 million people each year. <laughs> the main concourse, sorry. The current station, the third on the site, was built in 1903 to 1913. Its main concourse, originally known as the Express Concourse because of the departing intercity trains, is deliberately vast, a huge hall, 275 feet long, 120 feet wide, and 125 feet high, and is intended to underline the terminal status. Its elliptical, barrel-vaulted ceiling displays a highly decorated mural of the constellations. Ten globe-shaped chandeliers shed light on the crowns below. An 18-sided information booth in the center of the concourse is topped by a four-sided brass clock, probably the most iconic feature of the terminal. And next is the Lincoln Memorial. Also, if any of you have ever been to one of these places, let me know in the comments. I've never been to D.C., so I haven't seen any of these. Just as the turmoil of the Civil War was ending, President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in Washington, D.C. by a Confederate sympathizer. A simple statue was erected in his honor in 1868, but in response to public demand, the U.S. Senate approved a new, grander memorial in 1910. Designed by Henry Bacon in the form of a Greek dork temple, it was built between 1914 and 1922. Its construction was delayed by U.S. entry into World War I and wartime shortages of materials. Immortalized in stone. Within the memorial is a monumental seated statue of Lincoln made from Georgia white marble by sculptor Daniel Chester French. 
Behind the statue are carved inscriptions of two of Lincoln's famous speeches, the Gettysburg Address of 1863 and his second inaugural address of 1865. Standing at the western end of the National Mall, it has been the site of many historic events. Most notably, Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech was delivered here on August 28, 1963, at the end of the March on Washington. And next, you can see down here, the Jefferson Memorial, sorry, the Jefferson Memorial. How is it that my voice is perfectly fine until I hit record and then it starts getting all wonky? I don't know. Thomas Jefferson is one of the towering figures of American history. The principal author of the Declaration of Independence, written after separation from Great Britain in 1776. The new nation's first ever Secretary of State under President George Washington from 1790 to 1793, and its third president from 1801 to 1809. After retiring from public office, he founded the University of Virginia. Not that he is without reproach, for despite enshrining in the preamble to the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal, he was also the owner of many slaves who worked on his Virginia plantation. Sorry, <laughs> a neoclassical tribute. Jefferson was an architect as well, designing his own neoclassical house at Monticello in Virginia, which makes the neoclassical memorial to him in Washington, D.C. all the more apt. Designed by John Russell Pope and begun after his death in 1938, the memorial was officially dedicated by President Franklin D. Roosevelt on April 13, 1943, the 200th anniversary of Jefferson's birth. A 19-foot-tall bronze statue of Jefferson by the sculptor Rudolph Evans was placed inside the memorial in 1947, which replaced a bronze-painted plaster statue that was initially installed due to material shortages during World War II. The pediment on top of the main portico features a sculpture depicting the Committee of Five, the five members of the drafting committee of the Declaration of Independence. Excerpts from the Declaration and the 1777 Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, drafted by Jefferson when he was a member of the Virginia General Assembly, are carved on panels on the inside walls. Let's see what's next. It is, if you can guess, Mount Rushmore. <clears throat> The huge sculptures of Mount Rushmore in the Black Hills of South Dakota were conceived to promote tourism. Dwayne Robinson, a local historian who read about plans for the massive Confederate memorial on Stone Mountain in Georgia, decided in 1923 to create a similar site to attract visitors to South Dakota. Sculpting the Mountain The artist Gutson Borglum suggested Mount Rushmore as a possible site. In 1929, President Calvin Coolidge signed a bill creating a commission to oversee the project. Construction began in 1927, and the four faces, each 60 feet high, were completed between 1930 and 1939. The presidents, this is always like a trivia question, so pay attention, <laughs> George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Theodore Roosevelt, and Abraham Lincoln were chosen for their role in founding and preserving the Union and expanding its territory. The bulk of the mountain was carved using dynamite until only about three to six inches of rock remained. The drillers and carvers then drilled small holes into the granite in a process called honeycombing. Finally, the workers evened up the granite, creating a surface as smooth as pavement. The construction was ultimately completed in 1941. Next is, talk about them in a minute, the Chrysler building. Look at this thing. So neat. I love the photos in this book. In a city famed for its skyscrapers, the Chrysler building on the east side of Manhattan in New York City is the most renowned of them all. Whereas most tall buildings are faceless, solid slabs, the Chrysler building is an art deco masterpiece of high style and subtle design its top a metallic crown that lights up the skyline. Although the building was the headquarters of the Chrysler Corporation of Carmakers, the company did not own the building. 
it was built by Walter Chrysler, the company's founder, and served as the corporation's headquarters from 1930 until the mid-1950s. Walter liked the building so much that he decided to pay for it and own it himself so that his children could inherit it. Designed by William Van Allen at 1,046 feet high, it aimed to be the tallest building in the world. During construction, it overtook its nearest rival, 40 Wall Street, and when it opened on May 27, 1930, it claimed that towering prize. And then let's see what dethroned it from that. The Empire State Building. Boom, boom, boom. The Chrysler Building might win prizes for its beauty, but it is the Empire State Building that can claim to be New York's most iconic building. Ever since it opened on May 1st, 1931, just 20 months after contracts had been signed with its architects, Shreve, Lamb, and Harmon Associates, the Empire State has defined the city skyline, featured in countless movies and photographs. What movie do you associate the Empire State Building with? For me, it's definitely Sleepless in Seattle. At 1,250 feet high, or King Kong also, at 1,250 feet high, it was the tallest building in the world until it was overtaken by the World Trade Center in 1970. Yet it has not always been so popular. In its first year of opening, which coincided with the worst effects of the Great Depression, only 23% of its available space was occupied, which gave it the nickname the Empty State Building. Oops. Man, this is the most wobbly camera holder. I'm so sorry. Anyway, deco exterior and details. Structurally, the 102-story building is a steel frame covered with 10 million bricks and 730 tons of aluminum and stainless steel. Its stepped, uncompromisingly modern art deco form is complemented by interior details, including the ceiling murals in the lobby that depict the mechanical workers of the modern age in gold and aluminum leaf. The exterior of the tower comes to life when it is floodlit every evening. Next we have the Hoover Dam. Here it goes. With the expansion of the southwestern economy in the 1800s and 1900s, planners began to look to the mighty Colorado River as a source of power and water for a growing population. In December 1928, President Calvin Coolidge authorized the construction of a giant dam on the borders of Nevada and Arizona. Building the dam. To allow construction to begin, the flow of the Colorado was diverted through tunnels driven into the canyon walls. Watertight enclosures called coffer dams were built to protect the site from flooding, and the ground was cleared. The first concrete was poured in 1933, and by the time the dam was completed, it was the largest concrete structure ever made. The challenge for the engineers was to contain 8.44 cubic miles of water behind the dam. Part of the resistance was provided by the weight of the concrete itself. Additionally, with the point of the arch facing upstream, water was directed against the canyon's walls, serving to compress and strengthen the structure. The partially built dam, then known as the Boulder Dam, was opened by President Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1935. It was later renamed the Hoover Dam after President Herbert Hoover, who oversaw its initial construction. Next is one I'm very familiar with, <laughs> see all the time, the Golden Gate Bridge. It's kind of, you know, when you live near a very, very famous thing, you see it all the time, the, the magic of it really wears off, but it is absolutely gorgeous to drive across it. It is really breathtaking. Until the mid 20th century, San Francisco was the largest US city still served by ferry boats access across the Golden Gate, the one-mile-wide strait separating the northern tip of the San Francisco Peninsula from Marin County to its north, was by a 20-minute ferry journey that cost one dollar a vehicle. That is not what the ferry costs now. Overcoming Objections Building a bridge across the strait had often been considered 
but it was opposed by the U.S. Department of War as it could interfere with shipping. The Southern Pacific Railroad, a powerful business in California, also objected, as the bridge would provide competition for its ferry services. It filed a lawsuit against the project, prompting a mass boycott of its ferry services. After much argument, 1928, the California legislature set up the Golden Gate Bridge and Highway District as the official body to design, construct, and finance the bridge. The Wall Street crash of 1929 meant the district was unable to finance the project, but after bonds were raised locally, construction finally began on January 5th, 1933. The bridge itself is a simple suspension bridge designed by various structural engineers and architects. In order to cope with the high winds in the strait, the roadway was built to be thin and flexible enough to twist in the wind. The bridge is not golden. I always say that. It is orange. <laughs> golden Gate refers just to the strait below, but is painted a special color known as International Orange. I'm telling you, it's an orange bridge. Um, which was originally used as a sealant for the bridge. The U.S. Navy, however, had wanted the bridge to be painted with black and yellow stripes to ensure it was visible to passing ships. That would have been hideously ugly. <laughs> the day before it opened, on May 27, 1937, 200,000 local people crossed the bridge on foot and roller skates, but since then its main traffic has been motor vehicles. Using both U.S. Route 101 and California State Route 1, which merged across the bridge. Next is, get this later, the Pentagon. What was it? It was a bunny. Did you hear about the bunny that infiltrated the Pentagon and lived in this little park in here? It's been a cute little viral story. The the only outside non-American source to successfully integrate the Pentagon that we know of is a cute little bunny. Few visitors to the Pentagon, located just across the Potomac River in Virginia from Washington, D.C., describe it as a beautiful building. However, as the headquarters of the U.S. Department of Defense, it serves as an important purpose, housing around 250,000 military and civilian staff. The building was designed by American architect George Bergstrom and completed on January 15, 1943. Prime Target The Pentagon has five even-length sides, with five floors above ground and two below it, providing more than 6,500,000 square feet of space and 17 miles of corridors. At its center is a 215,000 square foot pentagonal plaza nicknamed Ground Zero, on the presumption that if the Soviet Union had attacked in the U.S. in a nuclear conflict during the Cold War, the Pentagon would have been the prime target. Although it survived the Cold War intact, the Pentagon was attacked on 9-11 when hijackers flew American Airlines Flight 77 into the western side of the building, killing 189 people, including 125 Pentagon employees. YouTube don't hate me for that. I'm just reading the book. <laughs> Next is the TWA Flight Center at JFK Airport, which looks like a big old paper airplane, in my opinion. There we go. In 1955, the authorities at New York's Idlewild Airport, renamed John F. Kennedy Airport in December 1963 in honor of the late president, determined that each of the major airlines using the airport should build and operate their own terminal. Transworld Airlines, or TWA, selected a bold, futuristic building by the Finnish-American architect Eero Saarinen. He built the Gateway Arch. Saarinen's terminal was a monument to aviation itself. It was covered with a prominent wing-shaped white concrete roof, while tall windows allowed passengers to view the incoming and outgoing aircraft outside. Passenger Innovations The new terminal opened on May 28, 1962, a year after Saarinen's premature death. It was one of the first to feature enclosed passenger jetways to allow passengers to enter and leave their aircraft safe from the elements outside. The terminal also sported baggage carousels, an electronic schedule board, and closed circuit television, or CCTV, all innovations at that time. In 1969, 
the terminal was expanded to handle more passengers. It closed in 2001, but was granted a new lease of life in 2015 when plans were announced to convert it into a hotel. That's cool. Oh, speaking of the Gateway Arch, it's another one I've been to. Um, but I was too chicken to go inside of it because I have a really rational fear of heights. And I knew I wouldn't enjoy myself, but I laid underneath it and looked straight up. It was really cool. The Gateway Arch stands on the site where the inland port city of St. Louis was founded on the west bank of the Mississippi River by two French fur traders, Pierre Lacled and Auguste Chouteau, in 1764. St. Louis has long been considered the gateway for American expansion to the West, as it was here that Meriwether Lewis and William Clark set out on their famous expedition of 1804 to the Pacific Coast. The Gateway Arch was built as a monument to the city's pioneering spirit and officially dedicated to the American people on May 25, 1968. Design and Construction the structure was designed in 1947 by the Finnish-American architect Eero Saarinen, but construction was delayed because of funding and planning issues, so it did not start until almost two years after Saarinen's death. Built of carbon steel and concrete, and coated with stainless steel, the arch is the tallest memorial in the U.S. A tram system inside it takes visitors up to the observation deck at the top. Next is the... Guggenheim Museum. Solomon Robert Guggenheim was born into wealth and increased his fortune with his gold mines and other investments. He began collecting art in the 1890s and after World War I retired to devote himself full-time to his collection. In 1939, his artistic foundation, set up to foster the appreciation of modern art, established a museum to house his growing collection. As the art overflowed its rented home, Guggenheim wrote in 1943 to Frank Lloyd Wright, America's preeminent modern architect, asking him to design a permanent home for his paintings. A spiral of art. Wright responded with one of New York's most extraordinary buildings. Cylindrical in shape and wider at the top than the bottom, it features a unique ramp galley that runs in a continuous spiral around the outer walls reaching up to the ceiling skylight. The finished museum is an inverted circular ziggurat that took seven years to build before it opened to the public in 1959. Inside and out, the building overwhelms. Next is the Space Needle. Here we go. Yeah. Seattle's landmark Space Needle, with its distinctive hourglass shape and elevated viewing platform, has been a symbol of the city since 1962. Standing 604 feet tall, it commands views of downtown Seattle and its inlet, as well as the more distant Cascade Range and Olympic Mountains. Strong and sturdy. Construction of the tower began on April 17, 1961, and was completed on December 8th the same year. Built to withstand earthquakes of up to magnitude 9.0, and winds of up to 199 miles per hour, as well as lightning strikes. The tower now features the world's first and only revolving glass floor, known as the Loop. Recent modifications to remove the mullions that restrict the view from the observation deck have brought the tower closer to the design intended by the original architects. Yeah, I've never gone on that. Also, go Kraken. Speaking of Seattle. Next is Habitat 67. Here we go. This extraordinary housing complex beside the banks of the St. Lawrence River in Montreal, Canada, began life as a master's thesis by the Israeli-Canadian architect Moshe Safdi. Safdi's academic advisor at McGill University later asked him to develop his plans for the forthcoming Expo 67, the World's Fair being held to celebrate Canada's centennial as an independent nation. Leaked modules. Habitat 67 reaches up to 12 stories in height. It consists of 354 identical prefabricated concrete boxes arranged in various combinations to make 146 residences, each made up of one to eight leaked boxes. 
the initial models of the project were built using Lego bricks in order to visualize how the finished building would look in three dimensions. Originally built as low-cost housing, Habitat has become a highly desirable residence. However, it failed to give rise to similar prefabricated buildings elsewhere, as its designer originally intended, nor did it revolutionize affordable housing for the masses. Which is too bad, that would be cool. Next is the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, going all the way down here. Perfect. History records that 58,320 men and women died serving with the U.S. Armed Forces in the Vietnam War, which lasted from 1955 to 1975. For some years, they went unremembered, but in 1982, a new memorial was opened in Constitution Gardens, next to the National Mall in Washington, D.C. You can see the Washington Monument right there. The wall, a memorial, a statue. The memorial consists of two 247-foot-long, highly polished black granite walls inscribed with the names of the dead in horizontal rows on 142 panels. Close to the wall is a memorial to the women who served in the war, most of them as nurses. There's also a bronze statue named the Three Soldiers, which includes the first representation of an African American on the National Mall. Together they form a poignant memorial to one of the U.S.'s lengthiest and most wasteful wars. Next is the CN Tower. Let me slide this up. Let me see, okay. We got one more page after this, just checking. The CN Tower. In 1968, the Canadian National, or CN, Railway built a communications and transmission tower to serve the Toronto area and as a symbol of its corporate vision. Work started in 1973 and was completed in 1976. The resulting tower measures 1,814 feet from the ground to the tip of its antenna tall enough to make it the world's highest tower until 2009, when it was overtaken by both the Burj Khalifa in Dubai and the Canton Tower in Guangzhou. Up in the skies. The main column of the tower consists of a hollow, concrete, hexagonal pillar containing stairwells and services. The tower was built using a hydraulically raised slip-form metal platform, which slowly moved upward at a rate of about 19 feet a day continually pouring new concrete as it rose above the just-set concrete below. In total, the tower contains 1.4 million cubic feet of concrete, all of which was mixed on site to ensure that it was of the correct consistency. To check that the tower was vertical, plumb lines were dropped from the slip form, slip form platform <laughs> and observed by instruments on the ground. On top of the column is a 335-foot-high metal broadcast antenna. Six glass-lined elevators located in the tower's outer supports take visitors to observation areas, although the glass floor and the outdoor observation deck are not for the faint-hearted, i.e. me. Sorry if I ever go to Toronto. Not going up there. Next is the Walt Disney Concert Hall, which, if you know your architecture just by looking at it, who do you think designed it? If you know your architecture at least. It's very obvious just by looking at it. <laughs> There's only one person who designs buildings that stunning and spectacular. The long and successful association between film producer Walt Disney and Hollywood and the city of Los Angeles was furthered in 1967 when his widow Lillian donated an initial 50 million dollars to build a new concert hall. Her gift would serve not only to enrich the lives of people living in the city, but also to stand as a memorial to her husband's close links to the arts. The new hall at 111 South Grand Avenue in downtown Los Angeles was the work of Canadian-born architect Frank Gehry. Who guessed it? It was Gehry. Whose radical design predated his titanium-clad Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, Spain, the building that made him famous. The hall's design was completed in 1991, but construction only began in earnest in 1999 due to a lack of funds and was finished in 2003. The concert hall officially opened with a gala concert on October 24th of the same year. 
sailing walls. Gary designed the auditorium to provide audiences with an intimate experience, wrapping them around the orchestra, and paid special attention to its acoustics, lining the walls and ceilings with Douglas fir and the floors with oak to enhance the sound. This functional interior is wrapped in a dramatic sculptural exterior inspired by the architect's love of sailing. Gary used a computer program more commonly put to work in the aerospace industry to design the stainless steel sails that wrap around the building. Some of the concave panels had to be dulled by lightly sanding their surfaces to prevent glare, their reflected light overheating nearby condominiums and increasing the risk of traffic accidents. But once this problem was overcome, the hall took its place as one of Los Angeles's finest buildings. And lastly, we have the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Just kind of a mouthful. There's no picture of the full building itself, but it's a really pretty picture of the fountain that's in the, the main like courtyard area. It'll say in here, the lobby, the, the, the room you walk into in a museum. The Civil War might have ended slavery, but its bitter legacy lived on for years. In 1915, a group of African-American veterans of the Union Army that fought in that war met for a reunion, bemoaning the racial discrimination they still faced. They formed a committee to build a memorial to African-American achievements, receiving approval in 1929 from President Hoover. Progress was slow and opposition fierce until the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of African American History and Culture, situated proudly on the National Mall in Washington, D.C., was finally opened on September 24, 2016 by the nation's first black president, Barack Obama. The museum houses more than 37,000 exhibits celebrating African American history. The building's dramatic shape, a three-tiered inverted pyramid, was inspired by the form of the crowns worn by Yoruban rulers in West Africa and mirrors the angles evident in the capstone of the nearby Washington Monument. The exterior is covered by a corona made of 3,600 bronze-colored metal panels, which you see in the picture up here. Sustainable Future Visitors enter from the National Mall through a sweeping porch into a huge central hall that offers expansive views to the upper and lower levels. 60% of the museum's volume is below ground. The building was constructed from locally sourced or salvaged materials and incorporates the best practices of green design in order to reduce its power and water consumption. And that's going to be the end for tonight. Next time we go to this series, we'll learn about natural and man-made wonders of Central and South America. So thank you so much for watching. I do hope that you found this video relaxing and educational. And I hope that you have a very good, good, good night.